Um, I am Tanya Kabala and I work for West Michigan Environmental Action Council. I have been with them since February and working primarily on climate action, water protection, environmental education, and um, helping um, West Michigan Environmental Action Council, commonly known as WEMIAC, expand uh, more into the lakeshore. They're based in Grand Rapids, have been there since 1968. So look, look them up, WEMIAC.org. It's, it's an excellent organization. And, um, I will likely be opening an office um, when when the pandemic permits in, in Muskegon. So very glad to have you all here working with Renee Hesselink. Uh, most folks know that she's our one of our top sustainability folks um, and Sophie Stokers from the Sierra Club. And we have launched uh, a series of virtual conversations, community conversations on climate change. We did our First one a few weeks ago, Jeff Auk was our wonderful moderator. We had Rose on board and Samantha, uh, with the idea being that we know um, that um, as we proceed with climate change, um, that there are going to be changes to our food supply, how we access it, where we get it from. And, um, you know, so our, our goal is with, with the last conversation and this one is to help make sure that um, people have access to good, healthy food. Um, and so uh, a volunteer of ours, Lauren Tarr, um, who has a, P who is seeking a PhD in environmental policy at Syracuse. And I think, are you a Montague resident, Lauren? Yeah, my parents have the house there. So we sp I spend summers there for sure. Okay. <laughs> and she um, um, volunteered to research um, what you can legally uh, grow as food in Muskegon County and um, which was excellent because I know that um, I, I know that I get a lot of questions about that and and people are wanting to especially with the pandemic have been wanting to um, you know, grow their own food more and and so this should be helpful. Uh, I'm, I'm going to ask that um, during the presentation if you can kind of keep yourself muted that would be great to cut down on background information. Uh, but after that, there's, since there's a relatively small group, um, you don't have to necessarily ask your questions just by chat, which is what you do with the larger groups. Um, and, oh, and just one reminder to our workshops, we're going to have a full series of community conversations on climate change next year, and we're in the process of developing topics. We are actually taking most of our topics from a book called Draw Drawdown. Um, and there's a website, drawdown.org, and it's a collection of the top strategies for reducing greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions. And, and these are things that we are hoping to promote at the community and local level. So um, check that out, but um, that's kind of our source book for, for that. Also keep in mind too, that I'm offering a number of different training opportunities for people who wanna get involved locally on the climate change issue. So get a hold of me if you are interested in, um, in that and, and in volunteering. I've got a couple other volunteers who are working on research projects related to that. So very excited to have you here. And um, um, Lauren, um, you're welcome to tell us a little bit more about yourself and maybe um, you want to share your screen. Yeah, let me get that up. And Lauren, how do you want to handle, do you want to handle questions as we go through the slides or would you like to wait? Um, yeah, you can do questions as we go. Um, I, I have a hard time seeing the chat while I have my screen shared. Um, so if you wanted to unmute yourself and read off a question or if someone wants to unmute themselves. Um, and then also because it's a small group and I know a lot of people here are growing their own food too. At the end, I have a slide where I'm hoping people will share their own thoughts and ideas and I can type them into the slide. So that way when this gets shared out, we kind of crowdsource some information at the end too. So there'll be room for discussion wherever people want to jump in. Okay, and certainly all of, our, all of our events are geared toward action. So to the extent that folks have any ideas on what this all means about taking action locally, um, your ideas are welcome. So take it away, Lauren. All right, thanks. Um, so yeah, so as Tanya said, I'm um, a student in Syracuse University here in New York uh, studying environmental policy, but I spent 
my childhood and all my summers in Montague, Michigan. So in this little project, I was looking up what are the regulations on growing your own food in Muskegon County. So this presentation, it won't be too long. I know everyone is zoomed out. So it'll be kind of short, but hopefully interesting. I'll start with some of the local, how do you find local regulations? And then an overview of within Muskegon County, what are some of the chicken and garden ordinances in particular? Um, and then what does it take to change a local ordinance? And then some resources for getting started at growing your own food. So to start to figure out what are you allowed to do in your yard and where you're living, um, some ways to find your local ordinances is, um, this is Municicode is a website and they, it's a really nice platform for local government documents. It doesn't include every local government, but the ones that it has, it makes it really easy to search and navigate. So if you're looking for bees or, or fowl or whatever, you can just type that search word in and it will search all the ordinances for that, for that township. But it doesn't, it might not always be up to date because it relies on the local officials to update it and they, there might be a little bit of a lag there. If you don't find things on Municicode, you can also go, of course, directly to a municipal website. These should hopefully all be update, up to date, but they're not always as user friendly. So some of them, they're each single ordinance might be its own PDF. So it's much harder to search throughout the whole thing. Um, when I was doing this little project, I found like looking up chickens, for example, sometimes it was under keeping animals as a section. Sometimes it was buried under zoning or special uses. So it can be kind of tricky if you can't keyword search it all at once. But they should be on the municipal websites. There's a couple other hosting locations. Michigan Township Services is a website that has some of the smaller townships for Muskegon. And the Muskegon County website also lists some of the ordinances. And if all of that was just too much work to go through, you can contact people by phone or email and hopefully the local officials would be able to just tell you the answer as you need it. So for this project here, I was looking in particular, can you grow gardens? Are there regulations on what gardens you can grow, what vegetables or fruits? Um, and can you raise chickens for eggs? Uh, some of the things to think about with this is oops, with chickens, um, some of the common concerns are noises. So some um, localities might allow hens, but not roosters, or you can have them, but you need to have a coop of a specific size, or you can have them, but you need to keep it clean or you need to keep it quiet. Um, and then with gardens, I found that most places, most municipalities didn't specify garden regulations, but there would be things more broadly about you can't have messy weeds or you can't have dead plants. You need to just kind of keep up the aesthetics of your, of your yard. But here I went through city by city, township by township. So within Montague, you are allowed to have fowl for eggs, um, up to eight if your lot is big enough for it. Um, Whitehall, you are not. And then Muskegon. You know what, Lauren, mm -hmm. I might interrupt you and just say, yeah. did, did, did Jeff Hawk, who's the city manager for Montague, did he want to weigh in on the Montague um, piece of this? Sure. <clears throat> so yeah, for chickens, I can just, just go through all of them. So chickens are allowed. It is dependent on size. Um, roosters are not allowed, so obviously a, a noise concern. Um, and then the other part of it, which it talks about in the ordinance, is the actual coop or building. So then it has to meet other regulations as far as accessory buildings, size, location, that sort of thing. Um, gardens, yes. The one thing that I was thinking about when you were talking, Lauren, is the other thing that's not specifically mentioned um, is fences. So a lot of times people will forget about fences, especially I know Montague Whitehall has a huge deer issue. So mm -hmm. making sure that if you fence that area, if it meets regulations. Um, the other, which is kind of also built into there are some smaller things as far as farm animals. So standard things like goats and cows, no, but um, beehives. In fact, I've got two beehives in our yard here. Other people have beehives around the area. 
Um, so there's quite a bit that's allowed. I think it might be a little bit different for Montague because we are kind of right on the edge of rural community, agricultural community. So I think it's a little bit more uh, acceptable to the community. So I guess that's, that's all I'll say at this point. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, thank you. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, so then in the more, more urban of the cities, so like Jeff said, Montague is a bit more on the rural side, but then the bigger cities like Muskegon, Muskegon Heights, they allow you to have chickens, but only as pets. And so I looked into a bit of what does that mean to have it as a pet versus a chicken that you're having as eggs. Um, and it could fall under the other regulations for keeping an animal. So you can have a pet, but it needs to be within a fenced yard or something like that. So it could be if you have a chicken as a pet, it needs to follow those same guidelines as if you had a, a pet dog or something. Um, but that could vary place by place. Um, and let's see. And Muskegon also had some guidances about making community gardens, um, and how, how to submit a, like a proposal for that and some of the kind of regulations for getting that approved. And then here in townships, um, basically all the townships allowed having chickens, either they didn't outright ban them or they just allow them in general. Um, so Cedar Creek, you're not allowed to have them in the high density residential, but you could in low density residential and agricultural districts. Um, and gardens just weren't really mentioned at all, but there are some, like I said, if you're thinking about, there's a potential that if it looks really weedy or unkempt that it could fall under like a nuisance, um, but just kind of keeping it clean and your neighbors aren't reporting you, you should be fine. And then one other thing that kind of stuck out to me is that in Fruitport Charter Township, they did specifically ban beekeeping, except for in the R4 district, but I didn't see beekeeping listed in the other ordinances. So that was, that was kind of stood out. Jeff, we were gonna, we plan, I knew you were coming, so I thought I would ask you about the beekeeping too. Um, why, do you know why somebody might want to limit or restrict beekeeping? Um, I, usually it's a safety concern um, and, you know, having people that are allergic to bee stings. Um, so what we've done in working with people is there's actually a lot of the local beekeeping associations have recommendations for keeping bees in urban areas. So give them or direct them to a copy of those resources, things like um, not having the hive entrance uh, directly located in front of a public area, sidewalk, driveways, things like that, planting shrubs in front of them. Um, so it's, I think the information is available. I think there's just a lot of uh, concern for the safety part of it that causes people to say no. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. And then here are just some more townships. Um, nothing really stood out in these ones. There's just a little bit of difference between each one's chicken regulations based on the size of your lot. Um, and then regulations about how big your coop needs to be per chicken. Um, there was with the Muskegon Charter Township, they did have a section about educational gardens. So that would be a garden on a library or it's outside of a school, but otherwise nothing about personal gardens. And then some of the villages and communities, um, it was, you were not allowed to have chickens in Lakewood or Ravina. The gardens were just not really mentioned. So yes, you can have them. One thing that stood out within Casnovia is under their section about weeds, they mentioned milkweed as something that you're not allowed to have, which I'm thinking is probably maybe an outdated nuisance or does anyone have, a, have insight on why milkweed had been banned at one point? That seems kind of odd considering a lot of people are planting it. I, well, and of course there is the idea that a weed is just a plant that grows where you don't want it, right? Mm -hmm. um, Jeff, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll pester you for a comment on this. What do you think? Yeah, I, I would probably agree with your comment there, Lauren, about um, outdated language. I would say in general, um, ordinances, you know, usually adopted and then not ever changed unless they need to be. And so 
you know, that's probably was just it's taken from another municipality, pasted in there, and it's been there since who knows, mm -hmm. 1980. We yeah. have we have ordinances on the books that have been on there since the 70s that we're working through. So I don't even know what daughters are. D O D D E R S. Yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah, know. I don't know. <laughs> Okay. Interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so then just kind of a little summary of the chickens is that within the county, 22 of the municipalities allow chickens, two it was unclear, and only three ban them. And then gardens, yes, everyone can grow a garden. Some other potential food related regulations, um, beekeeping, like I said, that tend to, to not be mentioned except for the one, one instance where it was banned. Livestock, that one's bigger and messier where I imagine if you intend to have livestock, you would be looking into those regulations and permits anyway. Um, and those depend on lot sizes. Uh, goats, I know some people want goats as pets or for their yards. Um, in a lot of the ordinances, goats were listed under livestock. So there might be a need to have that as a special use of having a goat as a pet or some sort of um, differentiation between goats as livestock versus goats as your home friend. Um, selling the food that you grow is also more complicated and a deeper issue to dive into. Um, but there's resources online where you could learn about that. Like um, Michigan State has a great extension service. So they do webinars about the cottage food law and different things that you can sell at a farmer's market versus not being able to sell without an approved kitchen. Um, and then auxiliary structures is another regulation that can kind of limit or change the way that you might grow food at home. So again, having your hoop houses or chicken coops, they might need to be in the backyard or of a certain height to, to fit whatever your local ordinance is. Oh, and then another thing to add on here is that honestly, for the most part, a lot of these might not be enforced very much. Like you could probably get away with having chickens if nobody reports you. So part of it could also be having good community relations if your neighbors don't mind that you have a, a messier looking garden or you talk to them about having chickens. It can help for a bit until you get ordinances changed. Laura, an, another comment being on my planning commission and city council is sometimes the ordinances are there for the ones who are kind of flagrant in violations. So, you know, if you're trying to, you know, be a good neighbor and, and do things the right way, um, you know, you probably wouldn't come under the, you know, the eye unless you had a neighbor that didn't uh, approve of you. Um, right. but, yeah, sometimes the ordinances are just there for um, those one or two few who, you know, who, who need that type of enforcement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So gifting your neighbor some eggs or some honey can maybe help you from getting stopped. Pardon me. Can I uh, ask a question in here regarding all the, the overlap of the um, where, when and where? So this works like there's a general state law and then as you move down in size of community, the local ordinances take over or do they work both at the same time in some cases? Well, I think that might, Laura may have an answer, but that generally Michigan is a home rule state. So there are a lot of, you know, there are a lot of decisions that made at the local level. Um, I, I don't know if you have a comment, but I know Jeff probably would. What, what, do, you, what do you think about the interplay of, of local and state, Jeff? Yeah, I, I agree that comment on the home rule. So usually, um, obviously you can't, um, if there's a state law, a local municipality can't supersede that um, to kind of get away from the state law, but you can be more restrictive on some of these items if it fits in with that home rule designation. Um, so there is some interplay, especially for um, cities um, their ordinance are more significant, have more strength of law than in the townships because townships can have a lot more interplay between the county and the local township ordinance as well. Well, that answered my question well, thank you. Another thing I looked into a little bit is changing ordinances. So if you are in one of the areas that, for example, does not allow chickens, but you would like to, to change that, um, there are 
there's been a lot of movement across Michigan and other states to kind of get these bands changed um, town by town. And Ferndale, which is a, a city in Metro Detroit, has a whole website about how to get chickens legalized in your city. And they give you kind of step-by-step -step advice and some example ordinances and ways to gather support and convince your commissioners. And, um, and then also list some just common reasons that your chicken ordinance might fail. And those are noise concerns and cleanliness and odor. And I screenshotted here an example from earlier this summer where Gaylord, they tried to get a chicken or backyard chicken ordinance, but the council rejected it. So kind of learning from other towns what's worked and what hasn't worked can help you. Um, kind of looking more from like the government perspective, the inside out, the Michigan Municipal League website and the Michigan Township Association website, both have trainings and free books for local leaders. So you can look up what are the procedures for adopting an ordinance. So if you are a citizen who wants to make a change in your community, understanding what are they learning from their side can help you present your case and know what they need to check in order to be successful. And then switching gears a little bit, just getting started. If you do want to start your own home garden, it is way more than a, a 20 minute webinar, but there are tons of free resources out there. You don't need to spend a lot of money. Um, so YouTube, so many great backyard farmers that that document what they're doing, what's working, what's not, library books, community groups. Some libraries even have free seed exchanges, which is neat, podcasts, and local knowledge, just talking to your neighbors, who is growing a garden, what's working for them, your farmer's market, learn from them. Um, and then Michigan State University Extension has a really great um, resource um, database where they have articles and, pod and webinars and publications where they'll teach you all about soil health and choosing plants, caring for them, harvesting, composting, canning, preserving recipes, beekeeping, anything you can think of. They have experts that are working on it. You can also just call them. They have a hotline for that. Another neat thing I found with the Michigan State Extension Service is soil tests. So you can get a little sample test kit from them and give them your soil. And I think it's $20 or something. And they'll tell you what nutrients are in your soil, which can help you determine what fertilizers you might need or what types of plants will do well or not well. And if you're in a more urban area or are concerned about contaminants, they do lead tests and uh, other toxin tests. Um, another thing about getting started that I kind of enjoy when I think about what's gonna work in my yard is thinking more long-term, what is the land use history of the area? So for Muskegon, we're on Anishinaabe land or Potawatomi in Ottawa tribes in particular. And so learning like what traditional foods have been grown here for millennia by people. Um, some of my professors are indigenous and they talk about the relationships between plants and people and that we co-evolve together. And if we wanna be successful, we gotta think about what plants are meant to be growing here. And that's kind of your best chance for success. So one of my favorite stories with the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee do it also is the three sisters planting. So this is corn, beans, and squash. And these three plants, they grow them together and they all complement each other really well. So the corn is really tall and grows as like a, a nice pole that then the beans will climb up it. And the beans put nitrogen into the soil to help stabilize the corn and keep it strong. And then the squash will go around it. And the squash provide cover. So that way the moisture stays in the soil and the leaves are kind of prickly so the pests don't come up. Um, I think there's one other thing they do. Oh, they keep the weeds out because they have the big leaves that cover out the plants. So that's one example of if you learn what has been grown here, it can kind of increase your odds of success. So that's an example of companion planting. So there's other, other resources you can learn about companion, <clears throat> companion planting. Um, and that's a way to, thinking about sustainability, a nice way to kind of avoid some of the the herbicides or pesticides if you're trying to avoid that. Um, and then perma permaculture, there's some great uh, farms like Blue Sky Farms and people on YouTube and books. There's tons of resources to learn how to do self-sufficient growing that's sustainable. And now I'll just kind of open it up and I'd love to hear what people, I'm sure many of you are planting things. So um, yeah, I'll just kind of open it for discussion and I might take some notes. So when this PowerPoint gets shared out, we can add some of those in here.
you're welcome to unmute and um, you know maybe you know indicate if you have a question or a comment. Um, you have any um, any any burning questions? Mm -hmm. What was this was this overall helpful to find out for our county, you think? It's certainly information that I did not know and I've lived here my whole life. Anybody have anything to add to this? I know Michaela, you have a new farm and um, Samantha, you've got McLaughlin grows and of course Jeff, you've got your your city background and natural resource conservation background. Uh, Tanya, mm -hmm. hi, uh, Jan. Uh, I just just a quick uh, just a quick note uh, from the beginnings of this discussion. I, I thought to add that uh, when you're talking about um, food and climate change, um, I would suggest that people check out if they haven't already nutritionfacts.org. Uh, nutritionfacts.org is a is a non nonprofit. Um, information resource uh, started by Dr. Greger, who's famous for many different books on plant-based eating. And this today's actually the video ran that he ran today, a little five minute video segment off his channel today, um, highlighted the studies that are showing that in fact, switching to growing your own food and eating more plants is better for the environment in the, and global warming. And climate change. Yeah. So and worth no, worth something noting on that. That more of a reason to do it. Nice, absolutely. absolutely. And yeah, and definitely the research shows that you know a plant based diet diet is is a huge reduction in carbon. And I tend to tell people, I mean, if you can't cut out meat entirely, I mean, you know, um, you know, have more of an emphasis on plant based um, plant based foods. Um, and the the other carbon connection is. Is something that people don't realize is food waste. Food waste um, when when food decays is a huge um, producer of, of methane gas, which is a is a greenhouse gas emission. So um, I I always tell young young students, you know, you know, eat, eat your food and you know and help global warming. <laughs> Any other comments or resources? That's a good one. By the way, I'm going to, um, Lauren is going to turn this into a PDF and we're going to send it out to everybody. So everybody will have the, the slide presentation as a PDF document. Oh, cool. Yeah. And, and you'll get the recording as well. I'm curious. Oh, uh, local, sorry. Uh, a local resource for more like community conversations would be the West Michigan Growers Group. Um, it's a lot of farmers that are a part of that. I am a part of that as a farm, but most of our meetings are open to the public. Um, so people that are just like curious about different growing things or what farms are up, up to, um, that could be a cool resource for people. I know that every time I join one, which is monthly, I feel like I learn a ton of different things about just like things I could be doing in my own space, so. Okay, awesome. look, could Thank you put you. that in the chat box and then Laura, Lauren can actually put that into the, the last slide, okay? If, if yeah. you know the link, that would be great. Samantha, do you have any resources to offer? What do you think? Or, or Rose? Hey, I was also gonna recommend the growers group. <laughs> I actually direct the group, so. Um, so yeah, the growers group is a really great resource. Um, in regards to local. Oh, good. Oh, uh, we've got experts here. I, I need to remember that. So other resources, other questions? I know I had a question for Laura and I said, I know some people who like to have goats, you know, to, you know, keep their yard down or have goat's milk. And it's interesting that that's kind of in the, the livestock category, which is not as, um, likely to be allowed. Right, yeah, it makes it more restrictive. Oh, nice, I saw Renee posted, they have a commercial approved kitchen for processing food, so. Oh, I'll kitchen 242, yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. This, I'm a, I'm a vegan entirely, so this isn't, this is just a curiosity question. Um, where would like 
rabbits fall for food for people who grow? Where did that fall in? I saw some of them, surprisingly, they, they put rabbits and chickens within the same line. Like here where I'm at in New York, you're allowed to have six, a combination of rabbits and chickens. So they lump them as if they're the same animal. Okay. But it kind of changes township by township. And, and some people just have them as pets and some well, have them as pets and, and dinner. <laughs> I guess. I guess where's the line? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Um, Does anyone have um, like a local seed or nursery that they like to go to for native seeds or native plants? Weezus has a really great native uh, like plant program. Um, I know the conservation district works with them quite frequently. Nice. Yeah, that was interesting because um, when Jeff was with the Muskegon Conservation District and did the Lake White Habitat Restoration Project around White Lake and I, I worked with them, the emphasis was on native species. And because of that, I believe we see started a native uh, plant program, right, Jeff? Yeah, that's correct. We kind of worked with them realizing that with all these projects, we were going to need tens of thousands of native plants and gave them a a plant list and they were able to source most of the seeds and uh, because of that then we kept pushing people there use them for other projects and now it's just part of their growing program so it's yeah it's a great awesome yeah. i was thinking about that the native plants along the bike trail there in montague and collecting some of the seeds from the flowers to then put in our own yard yeah. so you can also find some native plants just going to the parks too Harvest honorably, not taking too much. Right. <laughs> um, West Michigan uh, Conservation, I mean, excuse me, Muskegon County Conservation District for trees and shrubs and things like that. Yeah, Muskegon Conservation District. Is it mcd.org, I believe? I think it uh, is. Maybe. I think so. It might be muskegoncd.org. I'm trying to think. Mm. We can we can find that they're an excellent resource for for native plants for trees, um, you know, I think probably the the only area is local you know conservation group, nice. um, but just a, a very valuable organization. It, um, when when Jeff worked, they they did the native landscape at um, Helmet on Benston Road, um, and then Jeff, didn't you also do the one at Highlight? We did. Yep. And in fact, they just expanded that this year again. I saw that. I did have some people when I shared that on Facebook saying, where do I find out how to do this? And I said, contact the conservation district. Probably yeah, best. It's, it's muskegon.cd.org. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. You're welcome. If, um, does anybody have any ideas on action? I mean, this 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 is very useful information. I really appreciate Lauren's Lauren's work on this. I know it took quite a bit of time, and even as she was, she's in school. Um, glad to have her remotely you know, um, participating here. But does this information prompt any any ideas on action? Um, I I just one that had occurred to me in the course of this. Um, this uh, pro, pro, um, this information uh, webinar, but the um, the idea of forming you know a people organizing into some kind of loose um, product sharing group. So in other words, just people just go out and just say, "Here comes spring, plant whatever you like to grow," and not worry about growing too much of it because you know you have. A whole bunch of people who will take it and you'll be able to get stuff that they grow really well just so people can kind of focus on you know because some people in a mixed garden but they just do poorly at lettuces or they do poorly at some other product but grow beans like crazy you know you can just say yeah hey people can have them and i'll take something that they've got like a co-op okay, <laughs> yeah just like a, a, a virtually free in other words the cost that you would pay would have to be minimal or none in other words you you know, just say, what do the seeds cost you for that? Oh, here's a dollar, you know, to whatever. But in other words, not something done so that it's like barter, like trading, just like people sharing what they've got. Like, like everybody knows they grow in this one year, a bumper crop of zucchini comes in. So they just start giving it away, you know, 
and this is what you would do, but everybody would know that there's a group where you could go to and see what's available. You know, you know what? Um, uh, I don't know if folks know Teresa Wackernago, um, who, yeah, and she just posted on Facebook, come, I've got squash, come and get it. And, see, and yeah. I, I shared it. And then I was fortunate because one of my friends messaged me. She said, did you get any? I'm, no, I was too busy. And she's like, I'll drop some off at your house. So, you know, a lot of this, this food sharing, um, is there anything like that? Or is there any entity that could um, help with something like this? What an excellent idea, Jan. I'm wondering if you could start like a Facebook group. Um, I know coming from like a farm perspective, my take would probably be a little bit different because I want that for like farms doing a collective like crop planning but I think even from like a community garden standpoint it could be really cool to just have like a group to go to and like post in you know what Jan is that something you could do for me yeah I'm, I'm terrible at organizing things like that <laughs> I really am um I I can try to figure out how that works but no promises um, well, I can help you. But with I'll get back. I'll get back to you on on that and how to hook up to it if I get it successful. Well, and I there are a lot of people who can help you with a Facebook group, and then it would be up to us to help share it, right? Well, sure, yeah. And this is just a you know a thought I had. So okay, I'll give this. But I'm looking at this would be something to start, you know, to form in the spring is my idea. But I'll keep in touch and and I'll I'll figure it out. I can probably do that. Oh, I think it's excellent. And yeah, I, think I should learn how to do that anyway. So, well, yeah, and um, it's excellent because you can start kind of small too. just kind of just give it a start, see what happens. I just, no, I'll just put together a group and just say, hey, here, this is what this is for. And we can just fix it as it goes. It's not, it shouldn't cool. be that hard to do. I just don't know how to start groups, but I can learn that. Um, I would say I will uh, also offer that while I was working, I've since taken the winter off to avoid COVID. But when I was working, I would pass by um, regularly down uh, Lakedon and pass by where um, um, there's a McLaugh uh, McLaughlin Farms that do yeah. free food giveaway. They just set up right in front of Mercy with a with a little stand there and the big sign saying here free groceries because they they're growing this stuff in the community gardens and not enough people are eating it so they're just putting up a table and saying, you know, with people at it and saying, get your free, you know, come get free produce. So there are people out there that have this issue as well. And they might be a good resource to talk to about what they do to promote it. That's Samantha, right? I started that when I oh, was- Oh, did you? Oh, no kidding. The manager there, yeah. It was like less so not having like enough places to move the produce like we we had a ton of market streams but it was more so aligned with the idea of food access in the neighborhood and actually meeting some of those goals um but i have okay. since moved on from that position so i guess so yeah well yeah. i was glad to see yeah, it but you're, uh... you're you're probably you're probably um the manager of the mclaughlin girls now right Hey, no, not my job. <laughs> um, oh. I have my own farm elsewhere. I do uh, McLaughlin or McLaughlin's like farm and food education. So I do a lot of like prescription to health and like farm to school activities and things like that. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Absolutely. Any other ideas? Any anybody want to participate in something like this? I I'm. Um... Um, it, I, you know, I know that I know myself that it's better to grow your own food, but um, not everybody has a green thumb, you know, and so um, I'm going to offer up my writing skills for for produce. <laughs> there's a there's a bunch of questions in chat if somebody wants to look those. I mean, uh, I'd love to help on like action items in regards to like education is probably the biggest area I can help in. Yep, and it looks like Ray has said, or Renee has said, you know, getting this information out, spread it wide, publish a list of local small, small farms. Um, and I do think, I don't know if Rose is still on, I think there's the Muskegon Food Council, which mm -hmm. you know, 
ideally much of this would lay within their bailiwick, but I think they've been a little bit quiet since the pandemic from, from what I gather. I know there was a big in-person gathering um, a month or so before the pandemic, and I'm not sure what's what's happened. Um, but Samantha, you would be willing to, to help with the educational piece. And our, our goal is really just to kind of assist and inform and, and be a catalyst, you know, rather than running things ourselves. Um, Sophie, did you have something that you wanted to add? Sophie has been, uh, from the Sierra Club, has been working on this series of events as well. Yeah, um, sorry, by the way, my internet's been pretty unstable, so that's why my camera's been off, but it's really great to see all of you and just thanks for such a thoughtful conversation. This is a topic that, you know, I am constantly learning about. I, um, so I'm very happy to hear the interest um, and all of the knowledge that lies within the local level. It's uh, great to see the dedication towards this conversation. Um, as Tanya mentioned, though, I don't want to, you know, sound like a broken record, but yeah, this is hopefully going to serve as a really great platform, these conversations um, to just, yeah, hear from local folks like yourselves talking about different issue areas in relation to climate change um, and what we all need to be doing individually and collectively uh, to make sure that we're taking action. So um, beyond that, I don't think I really have anything else to add, but just thank you. It's great to see and hear from everyone. And we are going to be having just a whole host of topics. Um, tentatively, the one that we're looking at for January is energy efficiency. You know, so there, there's just a whole host of topics. I mean, of course, everything is connected to climate change. So we, um, our goal is to, you know, get the conversation going. Um, if you look at some of the surveys, you know, it, it's interesting to note that most people don't hear anybody talk to them about climate change. And so one of our goals is, is to change that. Let's start talking about climate change. You know, let's learn about it. Um, let's get the dialogue going. And then really, there's just a tremendous amount of things that can be done at the local level, not only to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, you know, transportation, building, you know, materials, recycling, but also in preparing for some of the impacts, which we have seen in our community, flooding and erosion and um, some of the, the crazy extreme storms. So um, it, you know, we, um, you know, we're in, we're in a climate emergency. Um, I think, you know, ideally the, the best way people will look at this as an opportunity to, um, to revamp our carbon and our economic system to, to make it better in all ways, you know. So um, I, ideally Muskegon County would be a leader in that respect. So also one more thing that I want to, yeah, go ahead, Sophie. Sorry. One more thing that I want to quick note is although we are putting together, you know, kind of conversations surrounding uh, ideas from the drawdown book, if you are hearing uh, things happening within your community or conversations around climate change that you notice that your neighbors are talking about or questioning or people that you work with, um, please do not hesitate to reach out. In fact, I'll actually put my email address in the chat. Uh, you know, the whole point of this is to make sure that we're making it relatable and relative to the concerns that are happening in the community. So although we have a list of uh, topics that we can talk about in relation to the book um, or what we are experiencing or learning ourselves, um, we definitely wanna hear from you too. Okay, what, what is MMGG, Samantha? Oh, West Machine Growers Group. Oh, okay, you're, you're planning a Lakeshore event this spring. Um, and um, you know what, let's absolutely, you know, let's make that happen. Uh, uh, okay. okay, any other questions or ideas? And, and certainly um, feel free to reach out to us and, you know, make suggestions for speakers, for panelists. Um, Ideally, we're going to be doing kind of a, you know, a panel once a month and then uh, as many lunch break presentations like this or lunch break as we can handle. We're, we're considering um, uh, how much we want to do in that respect, um, but certainly appreciate everybody taking their lunch hour for this and reach out to us with questions and um, we will put you um, on an email list to get notification of our other um, virtual conversations. And if 
if that's not of interest, just, just reply back and, and let us know, okay? Any final words, Renee or Sophie or Lauren? No, thank you. Thanks no. for having me. It was fun, fun to do. Well, let's give Renee a little thumbs up. Oh, <laughs> no, thanks. Thank you for everybody for joining. And it sounds like we got some good, good thoughts to plan for. Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. You, you're all very inspiring. Thank you so much and have a good rest of your day. Thanks. Bye, everybody.